Well, it's lovely to be here tonight, and I can't actually think of a better way to celebrate publication of uh, my third collection, Restorations, to be published by Saren today. And um, so I'm going to read a selection of poems from this particular collection. The first one is called Shellac. It has archived anemia, the Phillips London Library Globe, lowered onto kit box shelves in my parents' front room. Blue faded from an imperial lush, continents as technically thin green or lemon like magic painting, a collusion with flattened zones for military convenience. The world is traversable in Latinate script, variably sized with a hidden reasoning why Tashkent is larger than Alaska. It creaks on turning, dense longitude and tribes, impossibly fragile. Told not a toy, we sense how all that sediment, time, expansion, all the geography hours inflicted by dad, rest on two demi-hemispheres of paper, glued, pre-digital, childhood's dissolvable work, origami, shadows, balsa wood spitfires, paper, shaped, torn, spilt on, limp. A globe's constructed like a face, epidermis pasted to a mould, plastered, papered. Inside a wooden cross pinned to the equator, it carries losses, a thickened, darkened surface. Panelled in under a weight of old shellac and later wax, mouse trailed with gunk, 6,000 stars and planets on the celestial globe. The original so thin, belief is all that reels them out across space and cobalt. Thank you. So, uh, Restorations has um, a variety of themes, sort of loosely around preservation, why we preserve, how we preserve, and um, some of the topics include art and art restoration. And this is called The Artist Mixes Colour in the Renaissance. Don't think of me as lime-robed and lost in undailiness. I come with sleeves rolled up, worker in a mire of substance. Yes, I stink. I chew on a rotted wafer of dried fish glue, my saliva in the mix. How else to stretch the hue of some frosty cleric? My paints are part kill, rabbit skin, horse hoof, pig's blood. I knife mine, grind churn, pound steep, sweat my way to that primal blue you worship. When you varnish me with meaning, remember the grit under my nails, the fumes. Green comes from the labour camps you made for your longing. And that hair-coiled girl resolved from light. She's no touched up pink fix. She took on the earth to coagulate. Egg yolk, red clay, mineral, linen, marble dust. Do you think if she looked up, she wouldn't roar with the energy of her roots? And my final poem for this section um, was inspired by a painting of the Last Supper by the artist Vasari, which was very damaged in the Florence floods of 1966. And I saw before and after pictures of this painting, and I actually thought that the damaged version was far more interesting and evocative than the original, but um, whatever, it was beautifully restored back to its, um, as good as the original. This is called Last Sighting. Water unmarvelled us, dissolved tone, loaves, left a milky indecision like the start of blindness. Black seeped round the borders, shrank our perspective to a pinhole. Our wreathed arms sagged, snagged the circuit of lines leaping from robe to robe. Yellows, blue, carmine, rewilded. We slurred in a moth fog, lost difference. A pink smear remained on Judas, a sweetener, the departing drag of sunset, his face. Thank you. And then I'll hand back. Thank you very much, Felix. Thank you.
Well, we can't travel very far at the moment, but I'm going to whisk you off to Paris briefly. And this is called Paris. Lime trees are dumb with chlorophyll. Wasps nurse whatever sweetness the makers of crepe and beignet have smeared on the glistening air. They hang like half-cut bodyguards above the bent back of a girl who's thumbing the racks of vinyl. She sifts with forensic tip fingers, an archaeologist hunting codes locked in shimmer. Scratches buzz, gyrate a counterline, offbeat, off their heads, swamp crazy jazz, quivering on the city's white pate. The second poem is also themed around Paris, and it's inspired by the early 20th century Welsh artist Gwen John. And uh, she was in the habit of painting multiple versions of the same subject, often with small variations and tweaks, um, including uh, paintings of her own studio. This is called Or With Open Window, a corner of the artist studio in Paris by Gwen John. If she could agree to be this room or the other, possibility pleats her, not there, her outline sealed, but spreading invisible in two takes, one corner, one window, netted, unnetted, above a table that's the still crossfire where her looking springs out from an open book or coils back into a crease of wired flowers. On a white chair, her blue coat streams labile could let her slide through each frame. Even this one, where the window is closed, hard edges inside a stockade of angles. Or, with open window, the rooms misted. Sharp in the distance, she's hung a tent of reflections and sky. Where she waits can be folded, unfolded, like her paused umbrella like triangle sunlight on the wall that could pin her to its moment or warming outwards, paint her into the visible. So in a way that poem was about um, expansion of a personality. The second, this final poem is about the opposite and it's called Fitzroy's Barometer. We almost miss it exchanging tableau chaise long for wasps and cream in the castle cafeteria. We weren't shown to its corner spot, holding onto atmosphere, musty frame when morales rise and fall with weather's life cycle. Haven't we always been hooked on fluctuation? Even the deer rippled here among birches, whose stuffles make a chart of us as time does. Think of Fitzroy in the man shed of his cabin, squints to read, logs measurement through the slow curve it takes to furl F's, square light to moisture. Outside, buttressed against the weight of in. As I tweet this, response flicks back, no slow erosions, a siphon tube sunk in old snow of aged paper, mercury crusted to a dirty ice cap. Here, sulfuric green sludge has mushed the angle out of a hinge. Unlike Google Earth, this vista is for shrinking. Inner tubes hold a tiny, rivering script in ink-like weak coffee, and Himalayas are sketched in a wavery outline, an old man's flashback behind numbered horizontals, scree flows, crevasses, whole mountain ranges squeezed into the doll's house of 11 inches. Okay, thank you. It's called Annunciation. The angel was called Hermes, was there and then he wasn't. She'd been painting her nails with blue varnish and had to keep her hands out like spokes as it all sank in although she wanted to run for caffeine. It arrived on a light shaft from an unknown power source, instant delivery, but no options for feedback on the packaging, which was see-through but toughened. She squinted at the godlet in his one-man galaxy, shaped like a tear. 
The instruction said to place in water and watch it grow. She remembered a story about a baby crocodile in a bath who went overnight from cute lizardy wriggle to very large and toothy. She kept a close eye on the holy milk teeth, but they never became serious. In fact, he ate so little, she googled male eating disorder. There was nothing on divinity. He stayed thin and mealy coloured, grew his hair long, but only tried a man bun for a month, was into vinyl, upset her by joining a marginal cult. She wondered if there was a design fault. Hermes had called the blueprint inviolable as if it had a poor surface like old Pritt stick for vials and violets. Or it could be akin to some hard set word you might miss in the small print of a loan agreement. Was it meant to be reassuring? There were no real guidelines and no God the Father manifested with his feet on the ground, kicking a ball about. She'd applied for maintenance by phone, but got put on hold, then delivered to a liminal zone where they played the soundtrack to Pulp Fiction between ads for breast enhancement and smartphone upgrades. It was the age of incarnate lifestyle. When they finally answered, she was told he could not be returned and they were sorry. He didn't measure Miriam the original, but these days so much gets hacked into. They tried to match product to expectation, but these days data is so rapid, decays in a flash. This is called What the Butler, <clears throat> excuse me, What the Burglar Took. That night, it was nothing. Cinematic, he'd slid under the kitchen window, swerved an old veined saucer, rocked the vintage cactus, slippered his way across tiles on a malting rug and still, that still smelt of your last dog and made you wheeze. After that threshold, no sign, yet you felt him in every omission, the carriage clock that paced him but never chimed, silverfish parting by moonlight who'd fled into coven's of dust, slivers of street lamp, that laid a grid from back to front room where shadows failed to creak. His exit, another window, half open in the study. The room was rigid with night, the great bear encrypted in the cushions. You touched frost on the inside, took to spying on your house, heard whispers in the heating kettle, moss in the water pipes. Edgeland Map impossible to handle, like a cranky pet in our narrow car, refused to lie down in deference to rules, played limp on opening, hitchhiked the wind, tore along some latitude where our campsite was stowed, the cowpats, the mushy fringes through which we couldn't go. Map and friction were one. I never learned to close it, never got the hang of self-location, saw only unroll on a medical green, Contours as an auntish crochet unravelling, rivers a blue varicose wiggle. It was personal, confirmed the unfixable in me, an unfindable road. Maps lost their edges to mist, dark angels, bulge-cheeked cherubs blowing in vain. I saw the finger, not the ground truthed, until now, when mapless, I try to find an iris in the white of your dementia, and here the path digs down, not across, a mind rerooted in snow. Thank you. I'm going to finish with, um, in, in Restorations, there's uh, quite a few historical characters who surface, um, one of which is the plant hunter, Joseph Hooker, who was basically all about theft. And the next few poems are about him. The plant hunter. Item, there must be food in China, Joseph Hooker. He is a man of lists. It's like laying steps across the river. You need to think in pebbles when the jungle's losing you 10 ways at once. Tweeds, for example, camphor oil and string. China's the map on his desk, 
a lunar quilt, massed creases that mean height and emptiness, places where mules slide over, vertigo, flowers. Where there are flowers, there are people seeded to valleys, ledges, a yellow outcrop of monks, rice, eggs, fowl, logic is homespun and muscular, will get him from meal to meal to the altitude for theft. But first, there is the moment when he transforms, when he stands up at dawn above a forest and sees the mountains gilded like a prize. He'll possess the image before he breaks a stem. To get that far, you need to conserve your breath, square up, scale down, jam is essential to civilise mush, and whiskey is antiseptic. But nothing to dull the petals unfingered blue. Catalogue. Plant presses, blotters, ink, a moustache worn curled, an aptitude for dangling off for theory, hive mind of natives to actors, porter, spirit guide, lackey, cigars, adrenaline, an entitled extra meter on most who live here, whose bushy rampant speech you dismiss a jungle of dialect, yet may help to back cut through to the Latin singular, Selene, Campion, when you find her, tiny red mouth in a crevice, froths back as you pull, measure, dry her to a cipher. Barometer. Each day of this journey is full of chasms. The mountains turn on and off between mists, like blue light to trigger the morning, heel measure. Dew crazes two thermometers, he sinks into grass. Later, a bellowing shadow in a dust storm, he anvils the barometer against wind, notes nothing could be observed, disappointed. The day ends with damage unlisted, but an exact inking in of insects. He breathes on glass tubes, wipes in moonlight. My final poem of the evening is called Minnick, and this is about an Inuit man who, um, was brought back to New York um, on an expedition um, led by some American explorers. And he, he was persuaded to leave his native land and come to New York along with um, his father and a few other um, members of their family. And um, what actually happened is that they were taken to the Museum of Natural History and they were kept there as living specimens. And quite soon after he arrived, Minnick's father died um, of some infectious disease or other. He had no immunity. So I'm going to take up the story from there. Minnick. At his funeral, my father turned invisible. He who'd been eyed by thousands. His caribou, a hint at the wh white sharp fear they were missing, stink of a kill. They hid his corpse under furs. Only later did I learn it was trickery, a log in wolf's clothing. The curators bowed oiled heads as the dead wood passed them, theatric down a box-lined avenue. They squeezed my hand. In fact, he was having the time of his death, skinned, scoured, bleached, numbered, his bones polished for the cabinet, which I later found. And when the stone blocking my breath lifted for a moment, I silently asked my father how he would rearrange the view. What would be the engine? Would he place at its heart that Arctic seal, yellow light streaming from its dive? Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dominic.